All right, we have an interesting cat for you guys tonight. Uh, it's Kurt Bardella. He was the spokesperson for Breitbart News. Mm, interesting. He runs Endeavor Strategies, which uh, does work for sites like Daily Caller. Mm. Uh, he has worked for Republicans like Brian Bilbray, communications director for him. Uh, he was a press secretary for Maine Senator Olympia Snow, and maybe most famously, deputy communications director for Representative Daryl Issa, where um, my production team had some interactions with him. I don't know if he remembers that, but we'll talk about it. So, Kurt, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on. Uh, no problem. So, um, Kurt, I don't know where you're coming from, and I'm fascinated by it. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> you have an interesting background, uh, and obviously, you worked a lot in, in Republican circles, but you left Breitbart News, uh, you, you also left ICE's office. Uh, so let's start with Breitbart and then work our way through. Um, sure. Now, for the folks who don't know, tell us why you left uh, Breitbart. You know, when I first came uh, onto Breitbart, I was their media consultant. And their objective at the time was to try to build a platform that was chronicling what was going on in the center right. You know, this is a very congested uh, situation where you had a lot of different sites. Uh, Daily Caller, which I used to work with, Washington Examiner, IG Review. I mean, there was a lot of uh, different platforms popping up online. And there was room for someone to become kind of that dominant go to central place, telling the conversation that's going on in the Republican world. And you know, they started making some hiring decisions that I thought kind of supported the idea that they wanted to be more credible, uh, wanted to play a real substantive role in shaping that conversation that was unfolding on Capitol Hill. And then as the presidential primary, they started taking that really right turn. And when Donald Trump got into the presidential race, it became very clear that Breitbart was turning into the de facto propaganda arm of the Donald Trump campaign. And that's just something I had no desire to be a part of. He was not a candidate that I certainly was gonna support on either spectrum. And it all kind of came to a head when there was an incident with then Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski and one of the Breitbart reporters, former reporter Michelle Fields. And throughout that situation, I felt that I was being put uh, in an untenable position where I felt I was gonna have to lie to the media about what was really going on behind the scenes at Breitbart. And I made the decision to walk away from it. It just wasn't what I wanted to be a part of. Uh, I remember very vividly just you know, literally hopping out of the shower, sending an email to Bannon going effective immediately, I hereby resign. And that was the last time I ever talked to him. Hmm. Uh, but you, you were in PR, isn't that almost by definition lying to the press all the time? <laughs> well, I think there's a big difference in things that you can't volunteer versus things that are just flat out lies. And and the press will always want to know more than you're willing to tell them. But there's no reason why you can't just say, hey, like I really can't get into that and call it a day. In this situation, when you're trying to put out the idea that you're defending somebody while at the same time content is appearing on that website attacking that person, it's, it just becomes impossible. And it really just showed how far in the bag they were for Donald Trump, that they would be so willing to throw one of their own uh, overboard uh, at, you know, and, and not defend her. And, and again, that's just something I had no desire to be a part of. Yeah, no, I hear you, Kurt. And I want to get to your polit current political opinions in a second, uh, but let's stay on PR for a second. You know, I kid around that you know it, it means lying to the press. Of course it does, and you <laughs> could do it in a ethical way, uh, but um, but when you were at Daryl Issa's office, you also got in a little bit of trouble for a famous interview where you talked about manipulating the press. Sure. So take, take us back to that and tell, tell us what happened there. So we're going back to, I think this was around, I wanna say 2010, 2011. Um, you know, Issa had built a name for himself as the, as the ranking Republican on the oversight committee when they were in the minority. And then of course, really almost a shocking turn of events in two years, Republicans took back the House. Darrell was becoming chairman of the Oversight Committee. It's a lot of power, the ability to subpoena, hold investigations, congressional hearings. And uh, he was getting a lot of attention. Uh, and, and as his spokesperson, frankly, so was I. Um, and uh, I did a, I did an interview with, uh, well, there really, it was kind of two parts. One was with Ryan Lizza at the New Yorker, who wrote a very big profile piece about Darrell uh, and, and also mentioned my role in the organization. And then Mark Leibovich, more famously, was writing a book called This Town, which went on to become a New York Times bestseller. And in, uh, and in that process, he, uh, he initially actually set out to want to have Daryl be one of the chapters in this book. And instead, uh, he thought that I was a more interesting character 
uh, of course, I was an unwitting fool in going or going along with this at the time, and uh, ended up really sharing a lot of what I was doing and how I was doing it, my interactions with reporters, in an effort, honestly, to be transparent. I thought that the most accurate way to tell the story of what I did day in and day out was to just show them. Um, foolishly and naively not thinking that, of course, it would turn into something that it really wasn't, uh, and which ended up with me getting uh, very publicly fired. Uh, and, and I think this was in April of 2010 or 2011. So, I, and, uh, Kurt, I, I remember you from the ISA days. Uh, sure. you, I don't know if you remember this, but when I had the MSNBC show, whenever we talked about ISA, you'd call in and yell at us. Uh, <laughs> do you remember yeah. that? Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, Many a time, you and I remember Dylan Radican had a show too. I remember and, uh, and Ed Schultz. It was around that period of time, if I recall. Yeah, so you were way more aggressive than the other spokespeople. Um, so what was your take on that? Like, what? Why did you go in that direction? Uh, because I, I look, I don't know if it worked or or, or was counterproductive. Uh, we knew you were going to call, and we were amused by it. <laughs> so, it didn't, it didn't make us not do the story at all, but I was just wondering what your take on it was. Well, I think there, are, I think really there are two sides of that coin. On one hand, I'm a big believer as just a, a, an operator almost that you always want to make sure that people that you work with they know that you're watching their show, that you're paying attention, whether it's a producer, a reporter, an anchor, the talent, etc. Uh, and, and, and at the very least. Sometimes the job is just being able to tell your boss, hey, I talked to them, I, I gave them the, uh, the riot act and, and, and it turned out how it turned out, but it wasn't for lack of effort or trying. Uh, you know, certainly there are more productive ways depending on the situation to go about it. Um, you know, I think in all honesty, this was the you know, 25, 26 year old version of myself. I was very, I think young and arrogant. I, I, I personally experienced, I think a lot of too much success too soon. and didn't really know how to handle it. Um, and, and a lot of it went to my head and I made some really stupid mistakes and, and I think I conducted myself frankly like an ass uh, a lot of the time. But I do think that there's also as a press person, you, you do got to go to bat for your boss. And if you see something that you think is either unfair or isn't being covered the way you'd like to see it, there's nothing wrong with pointing that out as well. Um, look, I really appreciate you saying that because you were an ass. Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But in all seriousness, I, I also kind of appreciated your aggressiveness. Um, and it reminded me of when I was 25, 26 years old and very aggressive and Republican and an ass. So, <laughs> so Kurt, you're, that's why I said you're an interesting cat and my jury's out on you. So <laughs> maybe it'll come in by the end of this interview. Uh, so, uh, so tell me where you are today, meaning politically. like. What's your thoughts on Trump these days, Breitbart these days, and then what, what are you for? You know, it, it's funny, I spent pretty much almost my entire adult life working in Republican politics for Republican candidates, Republican members of Congress. And one of the things that I realized is once I, I divorced myself from that and, and had time to really just assess, what do I think? And you know, you spend every minute of every day defending your boss, your guy, and, and, and it's almost like it becomes more of a sport than real life, there's a, a competitive aspect to it. And the reality is if Democrats lose and Republicans win, that's good for my career. I get more opportunity, I get more visibility, I have uh, you know, more professional opportunities. And, and once you finally step outside of that, you actually have a real chance to do some self assessment and self reflection. And you start looking around and just going, you know, what is it that I really believe personally? And that's really what happened with me. Once I removed myself from the day in and day out battle of, of Republican versus Democrat, conservative versus liberal, I had the chance to just think about what was going on, the characters that were becoming dominant voices in the Republican Party, and, and, and get a sense of, of what, what agreed with me and what didn't. And the direction that the Republican Party started taking, particularly with Donald Trump as their nominee, uh, was just something that I personally could not get behind. Um, you know, whether it's positions on things like climate change or gay marriage or transgenders in the military or immigration. Um, you know, every single issue that that became an issue in this presidential campaign, I fervently disagreed with the position that Donald Trump and the Republican Party were taking, and it astounded me that after we spent the better part of eight years. Uh, at the oversight committee, lighting up Barack Obama, talking about transparency, talking about a higher standard, that so many Republicans were so silent while Donald Trump was doing the, the most unimaginable things possible as a candidate and now as president. And that hypocrisy really struck a chord with me. And I felt that if I had the opportunity to speak out uh, and a platform to do so, that, that 
there was a responsibility to do that after spending so much of my time uh, you know, pointing out some of the other things that I felt that Democrats and Barack Obama were doing that I disagreed with. Okay, that's really interesting about the sports and career. I wanna delve into that a little bit more. And now it's an interesting moment to, to take a, a, a second part of this interview, which is, so is it possible to be a Republican these days and be against the things that you mentioned earlier? Denying climate change, not being against immigrants, and all the things that Donald Trump is doing. Is there such a thing? <laughs> is that is such a kind of partial moderate Republican possible? I wish there were. Um, I don't think that there is. And, and, and it would be one thing if Republican leaders in Congress were very vocal and stepping out and saying, this is not the Republican Party that we believe in. This is not the Republican Party that we want to be a part of. We believe in a more inclusive, a broader party that accepts uh, all of these viewpoints. But instead, Really, they're 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 just being silent in a lot of ways and hoping that this storm passes them by, um, because there is a lack of leadership and a lack of, of of vocal opposition from within the Republican Party to Donald Trump. I don't think that there is a place anymore for a would be Republican like myself who wants to say that hey, there there can be a comprehensive way to deal with illegal immigration that doesn't involve mass deportations, which are completely unrealistic. You can be for gay marriage and an equal pay and, and and for everyone having the kind of life that they want to have and live the lifestyle that they want to have. Uh, being a Republican shouldn't mean that you're against government being an instrument of good and improving the condition of lives of people who need help. Unfortunately, I can't name you a single Republican who embodies that. And so I'm kind of left saying, yeah, I don't think there is a place in the Republican Party for people like me. That's really interesting. Um, let's, let's focus on two different things. One, uh, is Kasich close to that or, or, or not really? I don't think so. Um, I know Kasich's making a lot of headway, kind of being the anti-Trump in the Republican Party, but I also think that there was a reason why he was summarily rejected by every voter when he ran, including his own state. So I just don't see that as a viable path forward um, in terms of him being the leader of uh, you know, being a good enough leader that that rallies enough people around him to be impactful. I just don't see it with him. Okay, and Kurt, what are the Republican principles you still believe in? You know, I believe very much in you know the free market. I, you know, from from a you know, taxation standpoint, I do think that we do need tax reform in this country. Uh, you know, I absolutely believe in, 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 in the need for a check and balance of, of government. And I mean, there is a lot of government waste. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. You know, th there needs to be vigorous oversight over the federal government and, and taxpayer dollars are egregiously you know, subjected to waste, fraud and abuse. And, and that was one of the real principles that, that aligned me with Daryl Ice and the Oversight Committee when I was there. Uh, the, you know, those things I absolutely believe in. I believe in a strong national defense. I don't think we need to spend as much money on it the way that we do. I think that we can spend money better than we do. Um, but you know, from a homeland security standpoint, taxation of uh, traditionally where Republicans were on trade, supporting things like TPP, I absolutely believe in. Um, obviously, they've gone away from that, but traditionally, that's where they were. Yeah. Well, nobody knows what the Republican Party stands for after Trump, anyway. Right. <laughs> so, and that's the, problem. that's the big problem. Yeah. And you know, like even on things that they he's theoretically right wing on, like strong support of Israel, although that spans both parties. Well, kind of, but then he's kind of tough on them on the settlements, which is kind of a good thing. But then he'll say he's moving the embassy, but then he won't. So the bottom line is nobody knows what Trump stands for, and Trump is now the standard bearer for emptiness. Right. So, except filled with hatred and fear. So, right. but but I appreciate that that you stuck to what are your principles and didn't get. Swayed by that, but I want to. That's why I wanted to go back to to what you said, which really resonated with me. On it was kind of like sports. You said and and that you get so wrapped up in your career. And yeah, you know, in 2009, you're you know really young, and Politico puts you on there. 50 people to watch, top 35 under 35. That's got to be intoxicating, right? Yeah, you know, I always look at it as and kind of back to the sports analogy. I get it how you can sometimes have that athlete who gets drafted right out of high school, doesn't go to college, goes to the pros and kind of has a few missteps, has some growing pains because you're not conditioned to have that much success thrown at you without any kind of check and balance. 
And I feel like in my situation, I, I really, I, you know, I came to Capitol Hill very young. I was, I think, 22 when I came to Capitol Hill in 2006 uh, as a press secretary for for a congressman. And I went from that to working for a U.S. senator to, you know, a, a, you know, a, the oversight committee. And that all happened very, very quickly. I was within five years, and all of a sudden, I'm in my mid 20s, working for one of the most influential and visible members of Congress, having every reporter and every outlet. You know, reaching out every day because they, you know, we were in a position where we had a lot of interesting content. We had documents and subpoenas and emails and investigations, and everybody wanted the scoop. And this is really too when the online media started exploding, and it moved away from just traditional print, and 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 the Politico effect started kind of permeating throughout Capitol Hill. Cable TV became that much more competitive. There was a real race going on, and 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 I got to be kind of at the intersection of that day to day. And it was a rush, and 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 it, and it very much felt like a, a, a competitive sports environment. You know, every day we're out there, we're trying to beat the other guys, whether it's beat the press, beat the other Democrats. We're trying to get as much visibility, even competing with our own colleagues, with fellow Republicans who want want the spotlight as well. I mean, there's only so many hours in a day, so many publications that you can be in. And every time that Congressman A is on TV, that's that that means Congressman B wasn't on TV. And you're trying to, to 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 have this race of of exposure and visibility to try to grow, you know, the, the the sphere of influence that your boss has, because ultimately that's good for you. It, it sounds like the kind of atmosphere where it's easy to lose sight of principles uh, and get caught up in the rat race of winning. Yeah, because at no point in time does the conversation go well. What do I really think about this? What do I agree with this policy or not? You know, really, it's more of hey. We're trying to be the first ones out of the gate. We're trying to beat everybody else. There are 534 other members of Congress trying to get out there every day. It is a competition. And that was the lens for a very long time that I viewed what I was doing day in and day out. It was all about just winning. And it wasn't until I kind of had a chance to take a step back and really assess like, well, wait a second. Now that I don't have to do that day in and day out, now that I don't have to speak for somebody else, I can actually figure out what I believe and speak for myself, and, and and it was incredibly liberating. Yeah, that makes sense. So back then, what was your impression of reporters and the media overall that that you told Leibovich, and and generally what you thought of it? You know, I think that reporters were they were in a, between a rock and a hard place because they had to compete with their colleagues to get the story first, to get the scoop first. Uh, I can't tell you how many times. We would give a scoop to one outlet, and and minutes later, the other outlets are calling me, complaining about why they didn't get the scoop. Um, you know, th- th- there was a real challenge as they were trying to wrap their arms around this new online environment where things happen rapidly. It wasn't you could put something out there and it wouldn't come out until the next morning in the in the physical paper. Uh, you know, that that started evaporating, and so I think reporters were just all trying to figure out. How that would work in their newsroom and their ecosystem, and it really empowered people in my position, fellow press secretaries and flax, uh, to, to have a little bit more of an advantage because we were the ones that we were the keeper of the information. We could dole out scoops and pick who we wanted to get it and, and play a role in shaping that story because we were doing reporter A more of a solid uh, by giving it to them. And so it, it kind of changed the equilibrium a little bit and, and tilted it in the favor of people in my position as, as the media universe was trying to figure out just how to exist in, the, in, in, in that 21st century rapid response tech world. Hold on, because there's something really interesting that I want to find out about there. So uh, when when you say that uh, reporter A is trying to get the story from you and, and that gives you leverage, did you get a sense that the reporters then had an incentive to make sure that they covered the story in the way you wanted it covered so they'd get the next scoop? I would say that the advantage really was because there was only one place to get this kind of information, it allowed me to package it. In a way where you know, hey, anytime you get the first opportunity to present information, uh, you have an inherent advantage. You know, it's, it's think of it like a courtroom, and you get to kind of go first and make your case. And it's always harder. It's always harder for the defense 
to have to defend because they're going, they're following that. And I think in our case at the oversight committee, the, the, the advantage of being able to kind of frame it, the report at the end of the day can make whatever determination they wanted to make or whether they thought this was a legitimate story or not, or whether our angle was was the right one. And certainly going to the other uh, the other side of the congressional Democrats to ask them what their take was on what we were doing. You know, there were different opportunities to 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 kind of edit that, but there's no substitute in being able to go first. And I think that was really the inherent advantage. Got you. And uh, what do you make of the media and how they're covering Trump today? I think they're doing the best that they can. I mean, it's an unusual circumstance where, for the first time, the the administration is and the president is directly calling out outlets or reporters and and literally saying this one's good, this one's bad, this one's fake, these ones do a terrible job, and making up on a daily basis lies about them and perpetuating them. Uh, it, it, it is the most unusual environment where. The news networks and reporters and publications themselves are part of that story. And I think the biggest difference now versus before is, in some ways, Capitol Hill and Congress used to drive that, that daily conversation based on whatever policies they were taking on. Well, now the media, I think, is really more the epicenter of what's going on in chronicling this presidency. You almost learn more talking to a media reporter than you would a traditional political or congressional reporter. Um, hmm. And so I think that it's been an interesting change in just the day to day because you have a president now who's obsessed with the media and who spends more time probably watching TV and Twitter than any president ever before and is and is in real time responding to what he sees on cable television uh, that is a, an unusual dynamic that 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 puts a lot more responsibility really on the media to try to tell the story while also simultaneously being a part of it so um, let's talk about conservative media. You know, you were a spokesperson for Breitbart, and you used to also do some work with the Daily Caller. What do you make of them today? Well, Breitbart has become the de facto, and Steve has called it this. Steve Bannon's called it this. You know, it's his weapon of choice to advance his agenda, which is, which is, as he put it, is to really blow up everything. Uh, doesn't you know? They spend more time attacking Republicans than Democrats, and so I almost put Breitbart in a category of its own because when I think of conservative media, I think of National Review, the Weekly Standard, the Wall Street Journal, uh, who, who who spent more time focused on public policy and wanting to see and, and, and play a role in balancing and influencing the public policy conversation, whereas you know entities like Breitbart. Are, are almost much more personality driven. And, and the, the vigor and venom in which they attack people like Senate Leader Mitch McConnell or Speaker Paul Ryan, uh, different, you know, dubbing the people in the White House the West Wing Democrats or the West Wing globalists. Uh, what Breitbart is trying to do is very, very different than what other traditional conservative media outlets like Weekly Standard or National Review are doing. And so it's a, uh, it's a fascinating time in that ecosystem all to itself, as I think everyone's trying to realign and figure out how to maneuver around it all. How about Daily Caller? Now, Daily Caller, I feel like you know, you look at a lot of the talent actually that started at Daily Caller, and and were and they they almost were like a triple eight you know farm team for so many people who've gone on to 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 do some really great things in the media. Um, but I feel like that from an influential standpoint, I, I don't see them as being uh, part of that daily narrative anymore. Um, you know, they break a story here and there that might be interesting, but I don't feel like they're really leading the conversation. And I, and I'm not sure that that's what they're trying to do. You know, in their defense, I think that um, their their business model is a lot different than some of the other ones. I'm curious who your Endeavor Strategies represents. So you guys are a PR firm. You started it, right? You're the president and CEO. Yep. So who do you guys do PR for? You know, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, I started Endeavor when I left Daryl Ice's office back in, uh, I guess it was the end of 2013, and Breitbart was my, I think, my second client. When I made the decision to remove myself from the Breitbart world, uh, I, I really kind of knew that in some ways I, I was almost committing some sort of self-inflicting harm on my own business enterprise. Uh, you know, being dubbed kind of a Republican who who worked with Republicans and candidates and campaigns. Um, you know, I, I actually along the way, you're going to find this hilarious. I think uh, I started. I'm a big country music fan, and mm -hmm. I started a platform that's all about country music. Uh, it's a daily morning email. It's called the Morning Hangover, and it really caught on in Nashville. And I, and I spend the bulk of my time now uh, doing that actually, working in, in, in the country music space. That is so weird. <laughs> um, so, cuz I looked at, at, at your background and you grew up in New York and California. Yep. 
So you know, it's it, and it's when this is a full circle moment here. So when I got fired because of the Leibovich book, uh, obviously I was going through a very tough time. That's never a pleasant thing to go through, especially as public as it was in my case. And so a friend of mine uh, had the wherewithal just invite me to go to a show. She had an extra ticket. It was probably a good idea to get out of the house and go to an environment that knew nothing about what was going on on Capitol Hill. And it was a country music concert, and the concert was headlined by a guy named Jason Aldean. And I had the time of my life, and maybe it was just in that moment I needed something else to, to latch on to, just a, a positive influence of some kind. But I had such an amazing time that night, and I started going to concerts that summer and just became a really, really big fan. And a couple of years ago, I was at a show as the Rolling Stones were playing in Nashville, and I took my now wife uh, for her birthday to see them, and Brad Paisley was opening for them. And I was just talking to different people sitting around me who all worked in the industry. And I asked them casually, hey, what do you guys read in the morning to know what's going on? You know, In DC, we have all these morning emails uh, to d- digest and synthesize what's going on in politics. I was curious what their version of that was, and it didn't exist. And so I just thought about that for a few months, and then one day I thought, you know what? I think there's something to this idea. I'm gonna start an email that just tells you, who performed on GMA, who dropped a new music video, who, who's going on tour with whoever, and, and, and see if this works. And, and much to my shock, it did. Yeah, all right. well, God bless on that front. I'm an old school country fan, uh, back when the country stars were super liberal instead of super conservative. Uh, <laughs> but one last thing for you, Kurt, and another time we'll bring you back on and, and, and to maybe discuss slash debate some of the things you're wrong about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, the Republican things you still believe in. But, but I wanted to ask you, in your ideal world, in the world of politics, whether it's endeavor strategies or anything else, what do you do next if you are this quasi moderate Republican? I, I don't know that there's a space for it, so what do you do? You know, I've, I've, I've been very fortunate that I've had the opportunity to, to go on a lot of different platforms very regularly and, and, and provide the perspective of, of someone who's walked through the world of that Republican world from all the way as far right as Breitbart and all the way to the middle really as Olympia Snow, who was at the time the most moderate senator in the US Senate. And I think that there is a space for someone to just talk about what's going on and why and who doesn't have any conflict. I don't work for any candidate, any campaign. I'm not taking money from any of these people. So I have the luxury of being able to be honest because I've built a different life for myself in a completely separate ecosystem that I love and am passionate about. And that affords me the luxury of being honest about what I see happening and why and where there is hypocrisy or where there could be improvement or where there are pitfalls and what's going on. And so I'm very much enjoying that life kind of as a commentator uh, but one that's that's coming at it from a Republican perspective, who's walked through those worlds, but as someone who actually has the the luxury of being uh, transparent about it. All right, I have a conclusion. Uh, you're going to be progressive by then, but but <laughs> this but this is a good moment where you're somewhere in the middle, and that's why it's a good reminder to us, to our audience, not to be too harsh in judging people because everybody's got a different perspective, and at different times they have changing perspectives. And what I do. Uh, Respect about you, Curtis, two things. One is you are super hardworking and you were from day one. Uh, And two, you have an open mind. So uh, good enough, good enough. And so thank you for having this conversation. I appreciate it and I got a better sense of where you're coming from. And and good luck with Endeavor Strategies and Morning Hangover. We appreciate you coming on the Young Turks. Well, thanks for giving me the opportunity and, and, and hope I get to come on again sometime. Absolutely. Young Turks members get to watch every single interview live as it happens, tytnetwork.com slash join.